Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Spartan Theology. I'm really excited. I haven't done a live stream with a guest in a little while, so I'm really excited to have another show. We have an exciting guest. I got Dr. Andrew Abernathy on to talk about some Old Testament stuff, which I love. I was really, like, in the, when I first really got interested in theology, I was, like, all about Old Testament, Old Testament, and then recently I just found myself going down, like, a Paul rabbit hole, so I'm really <laughs> excited to kind of get back to some Old Testament stuff. This should be really exciting. But to kind of start things off, I just wanted to say that uh, we've been getting a lot more subscribers lately, so I'm appreciative of everybody who's recently subscribed. And if you're not subscribed and you're watching this, please hit that subscribe button. And if you're watching live right now or after the fact, hit the like and leave a comment. That definitely helps me get out there to more people because I really just want people to see this content. I think it's really good. And there's not... A ton of channels out there doing what I'm doing with like some really great scholars like Dr. Abernathy. So, yeah. So we recently had a stream with Randall Browser that was really good, and I got some really great streams planned in the future. But for this one, we're going to be talking about Dr. Abernathy's book, God's Messiah in the Old Testament. I definitely recommend picking it up. It's super accessible, but it's like a really great like sur survey of a lot of information. So it's like readable, but it goes through base. I mean, it goes through the whole Old Testament and talks about Jesus. So, what more would you want out of a book, right? So, uh, if first, before we get started off, if I could just kind of throw it over to Doctor Abernathy, kind of introduce himself a little bit, and then we'll get into the questions. But yeah, sounds good, Ethan. Thanks for having me on. And Ethan was just saying, you know, if they get up to a thousand subscribers it'll open things up on youtube so super excited to see uh your followers kind of coming along with you and you know it's always fun to get to talk about old testament and i guess if you're into paul then you have to still be into the old testament <laughs> so, yeah 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 it's not that i'm not at all it's just yeah, yeah. yeah. so uh <laughs> but yeah so i'm um i teach at wheaton college uh i uh, you know, probably three quarters of my load is undergrad. I'm teaching um, some hermeneutics classes, some general Old Testament classes. I, I got to teach uh, a class for a whole uh, half of a semester on God's Messiah in the Old Testament, which was tons of fun uh, last semester. And I also coordinate the MA in Biblical Exegesis program at Wheaton. So um I teach a bit in the um, grad side as well. So um, <clears throat> trying to think what else would be good for the re the listeners to know. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's any place people can find you, any other oh, shows yeah. you've been on or anything like that, or any other books you want to talk about. Yeah, too. you know, it's funny how, how I mean, I, I, I don't think it's me growing and having a bigger reputation, but I, I think there's just been a boom of podcasts in the since – you know, I, I published um, the, this book, God's Messiah in the Old Testament, came out, you know, in November. And I, I've probably been on 10 to 15 podcasts. And But this is my first Facebook Live, so it's, it's fun to be on with you. Okay, um, nice, nice. And um, I, uh, you know, but uh, you can follow me on Twitter uh, at um, I'm Abernathy OT Prof. And um, we... Uh, yeah, it's really been fun to connect with Ethan over uh, Twitter, and uh, we we're supposed to do the show a little while ago, but mm -hmm. <laughs> Ethan had twins, so 
Yeah, I, uh, I think we had it planned for like the day after or something. It was like really yeah. close, and I like I was this been revealed too, too yeah, much. Like, Ethan's like, "Hey, let, I just need some normalcy. Let's still do the show." And I'm like, "Yeah, I was like delusional at that point. I think still I'm like, trying to figure out what's I'm going like, on. bro, not not that big of a deal. It's just yeah. like, yeah, I I told yeah. him I'm I'm an identical twin and was born early, and I know my parents tell those." Uh, the stories of those early days so you're you're looking good though ethan you don't look too tired so nice nice well i tried to look decent <laughs> for this but yeah so i super appreciate it. yeah with, uh, with that we can kind of dive right in i'll kind of lay out what we're gonna how we're gonna do this i wanted to i first was thinking we kind of like survey through like you know just jump around throughout the book but as i was thinking more about like what would be best for people listening and stuff I mean, if you're really interested in the whole book, it's easy enough to buy the book and read it. So I figured what we could do is actually like touch on like more in depth and more like the introduction methodology. And then uh, I told Dr. Aramath too, I put it out on Twitter. I got some questions. And if people want to leave questions in the live chat, um, I think it'd be cool to like engage more with questions people actually have than just kind of like skimming through the book. But, and there's other podcasts too. I actually listened to your episode on, the tr- Ted, so the forward podcast. Oh yeah, forward podcast. Really yeah, yeah. But uh, with that, to kind of get started, like what kind of uh, like brought about the for to just jump into it, like what brought about the idea of this book? Have you always been an Old Testament guy? Has this been like something a long time in the works? Just kind of along those yeah, lines. Yeah, great, great, great question. So I, I uh, it was a Christian. Um, from the time I was 12, but I had a, I don't know if a detour is the right word, but a real season from about 16 to 20 where I I was really in rebellion, but it was kind of the Holy Spirit was just prodding away at me um, during that whole time. And I turned back to the Lord when I was 20 and I'm like, well, I guess people just read the Bible when they're serious about following God. And I just started reading it. And to me, that meant reading the Old Testament. So I was kind of naively just starting out my walk with the Lord, just reading the whole Bible and um, meeting with the Lord. I I certainly wouldn't have thought I had a calling to be an academic or write books on the Old Testament. It was more so, all right, I got to follow the Lord so that my, you know, so I can stay sober and kind (laughs) of, you know, somehow... Um, graduate from college and one thing led to another and I ended up loving Hebrew and different encouragement along the way I I ended up developing a calling to um, write in the area of the Old Testament and 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 I just the things I'm most passionate about with the Old Testament was really just stemming from getting to know God through it and one of the kind of aspects of the Old Testament I I really learned to love was, was more like Old Testament theology, big picture sort of questions um, that I think really matter uh, to the church. And um, so I've, you know, you you read the Old Testament and one of the big questions is, how do you read the Old Testament in light of Christ um, today? And so this question about where do we see a Messiah in the Old Testament has been a live one for me, but where it kind of, happened and turned into a book was my co-author Greg Goswell you'll see his name on there he is the most like Australian person you'll meet like Aussies are like never want to like have a high profile usually because they have this tall poppy syndrome like if you're just like getting too big of a head you're going to get cut you know you'll they'll cut you down like a tall poppy in a field um and so he's so humble, but this dude, I, I kept opening up every journal after journal, like Vetus Testamentum, journal for the study of the Old Testament, you know, Jets, all the, everywhere I looked, it was like Greg Goswell, Messiah in the book of Daniel, Greg Goswell, Messiah. And I'm like, <laughs> I read it, I was teaching at Ridley down in Melbourne at the time. And, and I say, and Greg and I would run into each other at the library there. He was teaching at a school in Melbourne as well. I said, Greg, man, you got a book in the works. I can see you're going to be writing on Messiah in the Old Testament. And he kind of humbly laughed. And then after he read a chapter that I wrote in my book, 
um, the book of Isaiah and God's kingdom, he, he's like, man, I think we're on the same page on a lot of things in terms of how we're thinking about Messiah in the Old Testament. Would you want to co-write a book with me? And um, Mike, yeah, I'd love to <laughs> with you, you know, because he's, he's so knowledgeable. Um, so for him, it was a matter of like kind of toning down his more academic uh, articles that he's written on different parts of the Bible. On the side. And for me, it was more um, some fresh study, which was a ton of fun. So, so that's kind of where this book came from. And I guess I'll say one more thing. One of the big questions students are always wondering is like, all right, what's a good resource on Messiah in the Old Testament? And, you know, there are a few books out there. One, one was an edited volume uh, called The Lord's Anointed. Um, but anytime you have an edited volume, the, the chapters aren't coherent. There's no sort of, you know, cohesive vision. Um, Kaiser has a book on Messiah in the Old Testament, but it's kind of choppy just dealing with individual passages here and there. And uh, Greg and I thought we could really, um, you know, provide something that could be useful in the classroom, useful to pastors, useful to educated uh, readers in the church. So. Yeah, I actually really appreciate that. Like the, I didn't think so much about comparing it to like a, you know, a collection of essays or whatever. But it is, as I think about like reading through this, it is nice to have the same voices throughout, you know, the book. Sometimes with a collection of papers or essays or whatever, it, it you read a one and then it's like, okay, now I got another book essentially to start, you know, with the next one. Yeah, yeah. This, this was nice to have like the same, you know, voices throughout. So yeah, that yeah. Really good. Thank you. So for next question, as far as like the right in the beginning, you talk about how this book is all about like, I mean, the, the, which quote, the subtitle says it expectations of a coming King. And you're really talking about like the Royal uh, Messiah, not necessarily like there, you acknowledge that there's, you know, prophetic imagery and priestly, you know, stuff like about a priestly Messiah. But really what you're talking about is the royal messiah. So if you could kind of talk about that a little bit, like why you chose to write that way and, you know, what the yeah. importance of the royal messiah as opposed to other sort of descriptions. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, you, Ethan, you have, you have your thumb on the pulse of kind of what we're trying to do in the book. I mean, there's this book by, um, but also published by Baker a long time ago by a scholar named Van Groningen. And when you read Von Groningen on like Messiah in the Old Testament, I can't remember the exact title. His kind of what he includes in Messiah is pretty much everything. <laughs> <laughs> so like you're reading like his thoughts on almost every chapter in the Bible. So like if you open it up and are like, all right, where do we see Jesus in the Old Testament, man, all of a sudden, every passage that talks about God, because Jesus is <laughs> one of the Trinity, any, anything could all of a sudden be fair, fair game for the topic. So like we wanted something kind of narrow enough, which publishers like, because, you know, it's like a focused mm -hmm. topic and doesn't end up turning into a, a book the length of N.T. Wright's books. Um, <laughs> and um, we... Um, so we wanted it to be narrow enough in scope that it actually like what we we're saying was kind of tied into a more narrow topic. And within Messiah in general, um, we kind of shared a similar outlook in that when you think about the vision of the Old Testament, where does it talk about a Messiah in the sense of some sort of anointed lead figure that God is going to use to bring about his purposes. Um, for those listeners who, who aren't as familiar, the, the term Messiah comes from the Hebrew noun Mashiach, which comes from kind of the verb which means to anoint. And you see figures like Saul is called a Mashiach, David is called a Mashiach, you see some priests on occasion called Mashiach and perhaps even prophets. So there are these kind of anointed figures like within Israel's history that are kind of playing a real specific role in God's plans and in the present. 
And what we wanted to ask is, okay, there are a range of ways that God could kind of, and, and does in history kind of anoint certain figures to kind of carry out important purposes for him. But if we think specifically about the royal strand of that, like God anointing and having a king in place, what do we see? What, what are these expectations of kind of a king um, that's to come uh, and play an important role in, in God's um, program? And, you know, it, I guess in terms of responses uh, for, to the book so far, uh, by and large, have been really um, positive, which has been great. But, you know, the, the critiques we see some uh, that I've heard the most are from people that were not like messianic enough, <laughs> like, you know, people who want me to, hey, what about the bronze serpent in, <laughs> that gets hung up in the book of, of mm -hmm. numbers and nail them? Hey, I'm all for that pointing to Jesus, but I don't necessarily see that as a royal figure or a kingly figure, you know? And so what I want to acknowledge is there's tons of different streams and ways the Old Testament can be pointing to Jesus, but, but we're just kind of thinking specifically about the royal side of things. So, um, so that, that's a bit methodologically what we're trying to do. And, um, you know, I, I'm sure I'll be able to unpack that more as we, we go through different questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was actually listening to Michael Brown a little bit the other day, and um, he made a point that, like, in Jewish interpretations of the Bible, essentially, like, everything is about God's law. You know, like, every single point is like, oh, this is about the law, this is about the law. They kind of, like, tie everything back. And he was mentioning, like, one of his uh like uh, another jewish person who came like over to america uh, basically another messy a jew that had come to faith in christ and um he like just switched it up and like everything pointed to jesus like every single dude -do -do. mm -hmm. so as you were saying that i could see how like some people like you know every single thing points to jesus but like nailing it down to like a royal thing actually gives the book a flow and a point or whatever yeah that yeah. makes a lot of sense that yeah. you wouldn't have to and I, point at every just, verse in the old yeah. testament it, and and i'm happy for you to bounce off of this but you know my writing our writing isn't as much like i would say apologetics like michael brown's into but like i'd hope it could feed into apologetics but as i we kind of write kind of out of um, as part of like the field of Old Testament studies, like one of the important starting points is like, how do we read the scriptures in a way that honors like God's desire to speak to people of the time and in ancient historical context? So we're kind of slower to want to, um, to want to kind of jump too quickly to kind of messianic claims we want to kind of have more slower more sober judgment on like what the texts actually seem to be communicating at least in their first readings um and how are those kind of pointing forward and, and so i think that's again another reason like we're maybe uh just a bit more cautious and wanting to be more um specific on on what we're after um when we're saying kind of the old testament has these royal messianic expectations and because what what you'll see is like a number of new testament scholars look to the old testament and say hey there's no promises of a coming messianic king and and we're like whoa 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 wait a minute all right let's, let's rethink that one what is that because you don't see the term mashiach in particular being used or is that because you don't see this concept of a hope for a future king, which kind of later we can look back and kind of, okay, if we wanted to have a label for these different sorts of hopes of a future king, we could just refer to them as all as messianic, even if the term Messiah doesn't occur. And um, so we're trying to kind of, I think, make contributions to, at a number of levels of kind of reaffirming no the old testament maybe has a bit more to say um about a hope for a coming um coming king 
Yeah, but I definitely, like, appreciate it. For myself, I'm not, like... I'm, I'm very... I can maybe sometimes too much, but I, I can be very critical of like apologetic methods when they, I think, to reach too far. Because I think it's in the end, it's very harmful because you're just not doing justice to what the text actually says. And I actually really appreciated how in this book you really weren't stretching. I didn't feel like anywhere you're just like, oh, this is a, like, this is clearly Jesus or anything. Like the, the book makes a point that, first off, it's talking about a coming royal king, a king. Messi messianic ugh, I'm just tripping over my words a <laughs> royal messiah it's not necessarily like you know jesus is not specifically like you may like we obviously there's jewish people out there that read the bible right you know they and that don't believe yeah. in jesus and we would admit that they can read the bible that way right and like so it's only we only see it as clearly jesus in light of christ after the fact right you know we can't you can't like find jesus in the old testament before like i don't know if if what i'm exa make, exactly making sense but i've been looking into like like i said with paul so a lot of this like apocalyptic paul is what i've been looking into and how like it's clear that it, there was like a like when jesus showed up things changed right and mm -hmm. like we see things yeah. differently now and so i appreciate how like in this book it's like i said we're looking at a royal messiah and these things can be interpreted in a number of ways, but like I said, it's there's prophecies, and then in light of Christ, we see them clearly as pointing to Jesus. Is all really that was meant to say, and I just appreciate how, like I said, you weren't really stretching to make an apologetic point or anything like that. It's just what does the text have to say about a coming royal yeah. Messiah? Yeah. And I think yeah. a point that really like hits at home. And I actually included it in one of my questions so we could talk about it now. It's like your Genesis 3, where you talk about the seed of the woman. And how a lot of people want to say, like, oh, that's Jesus, Jesus. But you really, like, go into what the text says there. And, like, is that pointing to Jesus or is that something else? So if you could kind of talk about that a little bit. Because I think that's really, like, a great example of what we're talking yeah. about here. Yeah, that that's a great, um, great, I, I think text to point to that that illustrates kind of what we're doing you know when you think about genesis one to three which is kind of the creation and fall you know it really launches the storyline of scripture so i think one's wise to look there whenever you're thinking kind of what's the big picture aims of, of the whole of scripture and there's been a tradition of kind of looking at genesis 3 15 which is this curse um that god gives uh to the serpent and what what god says there is and i'm i only have my uh let's see here one nice thing about being a colleague with john walton he, he like gives me free bibles um <laughs> and he has his background study bible he gave me and that's the one i happen to have here and it's new new king james version so i i uh not that I'm a KJV only guy, yeah. <laughs> um, but it, but it's a great resource. Um, oh, okay. So it's interesting to see how it's translated here. What what God says in Genesis three fifteen, He's speaking to the serpent after He deceived Eve. He says, "I'll put en I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He will bruise your head." and you shall bruise his heel. So there's a couple interesting things to me about that translation where it says, I'll put enmity between your seed and her seed. In the New King James Version, the second seed, her seed is capital S. So between your seed, Satan, and her seed, capital S, seed. Um, so, and he will bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel and, and you know the the kind of reading that i think is really common um in uh, especially some e evangelical churches will say okay when you read this it, it's talking about the seed of eve namely jesus and there's going to be a battle between jesus and the seed of satan and ultimately, 
the seed of this woman, it's often translated as he will crush your head, and, but you will strike his heel. Um, but in Hebrew, it's the same verbs uh, for both. Okay, he will bruise your head. You will bruise his heel. You, you know, there's, there's not as much uh, decisiveness, if you will, that we, one might expect. But I do think that because this is a curse towards the serpent um, and the fact that Eve's offspring will get the serpent in the head, uh, it does seem to point to an ultimate decisive blow. But what I, what, what I argue in that chapter is what's not clear at this point is that this is only going to be one offspring or seed of the woman. I think ultimately we do see that in Jesus to some extent, um, but in the very next chapter, you see this enmity between the seed of Eve, who is Cain and Abel, and Satan. Sin is crouching at Cain's door, and there's just going to continue to be this battle between good and evil to this sort of will there be a humanity that that can overcome this this evil one and i think that hope for a seed of eve eventually narrows down to abram's line there's begins to be hope that maybe uh, that collective sort of hope that maybe um israel will be able to overcome uh the evil one and eventually this seed kind of offspring promise does kind of connect with the Davidic king in 2 Samuel 7. But, but what's striking to me, and, and we bring this out at the end of the chapter, is this sort of collective idea, that idea of the seed of woman that will hopefully crush the head of, of or bruise the head of the serpent, actually gets taken up in both a singular way to talk about Jesus as the seed, but also collectively, the, the, the most clear examples that I think it's in first or, or Romans 16, where it talks about God will soon crush Satan underneath the feet of the church. So this sort of, what this does is it adds, I think, a layer of, instead of just jumping directly to Jesus, oh, Jesus is the offspring, but to see how this is, wedded into this larger battle between humanity and the evil one and how what Jesus did in his victory is wrapped up in his recovery of a collective church, if you will, that of, will also with Christ have victory over the evil one when, when all is finished. So, so that sort of nuanced way of bringing out that collective element, which a lot of scholars see, and I think is probably the most straightforward reading of the passage in its original context, but then drawing that into the larger biblical theology that you see developed throughout the Old Testament and how it's used in the New it gives you a nice, what I think is a really rich um, reading of, of uh, this passage. Totally agree. Yeah, that was really well said. And I think that like really gets at what we were talking about there. So that's, yeah, I appreciate that. So yeah. um, I think another good question was one I got from on Twitter from Joey the Christian. Uh, we're, we've talked a lot on Twitter, but I realize his name's kind of <laughs> funny. But, but uh, he says, based on the understanding of the Messianic text in the Old Testament, is it reasonable to conclude the writers of the New Testament consider Jesus both to be an apocalyptic apocalyptic prophet and the Messiah? And I thought that was a really interesting question, mm -hmm. like because obviously Jesus is an apocalyptic prophet. So is it like, mm -hmm. do you, is it would you say it's kind of expected that the Messiah would also be like this apocalyptic prophet and? Yeah, if you could just kind of touch on that a little bit. Yeah, that that's a great, great question. Um, so J you said it's Joey the Christian? Yeah. I like it. You know, that's like yeah. Pliny the Elder, you know, yeah. Joey the Christian. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so, so it's a really good question. If I could just tie into kind of that larger question of, is, is he expected to be a, the Messiah and also an eschatological prophet? 
think we need to be clear on kind of, okay, wh what are we saying when we're saying, is he expected to be the Messiah? All right. So if we're talking about, is he, ex is he the expected royal Messiah? We'd be looking for those more royal elements, right? That this sort of one who's called the son of David. He, he's one who's going to be ruling with justice and righteousness and promoting peace. We're, we're seeing um, him playing a role of bringing about God's rule in the world. But I do think that there are strands in the Old Testament, which we might even call messianic, that are prophetic in nature. I think a great example of that is in Isaiah 61, where in Isaiah 61, it, it's that passage that Jesus quotes um, in Luke 4. And he says, the spirit of God is upon me. And he has anointed me. So there's that word anointed. That word that comes from Mashiach, Mashiach where, where we have Messiah coming from. That this sort of anointed figure. And what is that figure in Isaiah 61 anointed, empowered by the spirit of God to do? It's all proclamatory. To proclaim liberty to the captive, you know, to com bring comfort, presumably through the spoken word, through being this mouthpiece of God, announcing the inbreaking of God's rule. So if we want to kind of branch out Messiah from just simply royal Messiah to include prophetic Messiah, and I, I think also a priestly Messiah, Messianic strands, I think we can see that. Uh, certainly in Jesus being this sort of prophetic, apocalyptic um, voice, right, who's announcing the inbreaking of God's um, kingdom. And um, I think in Acts, they, they refer to Jesus at quoting from, um, I think maybe even Deuteronomy 18, this sort of prophet like Moses who, who's who been risen up. And so I think, it, and I mean, you, you speaking of Luke and Acts, I mean, a lot of what he's done, does is modeled off of Elijah and Elisha. And so this prophetic strand of Jesus, I, I think is there absolutely. So um, yeah, so I think that's a great, question and maybe gives us a chance to kind of clarify categories a little bit of well mm -hmm. you know if you want to include prophetic and messianic uh which i have no problem with um you know we could say there's a messianic prophetic apocalyptic sort yeah. of thing <laughs> so yeah for sure for sure i think that's really important though it's really it's good how that question like you said helps us kind of clear up categories because like you said i mean as far as do these things tie into the messiah what do you mean by that right like there's so yeah. many different strands and stuff yeah. so i think that yeah i think yeah. that was really good and ethan but, if i could can i oh, riff on that just a little bit yeah 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 go ahead okay so like so here's another thing too and i don't know what i think about using the term messianic for this as much but like when you talk about this prophetic apocalyptic sort of voice and what's striking to me in the prophets, like they do talk about coming like royal kings, but what they're talking about most is like that God is going to come, mm -hmm. <laughs> that God is going to come and like in break into the world. And like, so I think what we see in Jesus, like he's kind of like this royal figure he's this prophetic figure but he's also the embodiment of like god breaking into the world so he's like also the embodiment of like the hope of god right um coming in and breaking in and so the, the sort of wedding of those dynamics are just I don't know fully that in the Old Testament, it, it, like you were saying before, that it would have been entirely clear, kind of looking forward that all of these strands would be coming together in one fully human, fully divine person. Um, and, and that they do is just absolutely um, breathtaking. Yeah, yeah. And I think something else, as you were talking, 
about like in I found it in Acts. It's Acts three. Uh, the Lord God will raise up a prophet like me, where like Luke draws from whatever Deuteronomy or whatever. But I was also thinking as you're talking in John, there's like a very similar thing where they and that's what I was trying to find as you were talking, but where it says like he's the prophet like Moses, basically, you know. So yeah. like clearly there's these like different different strands of Messiah, right? Like different yeah. things people were thinking about as far yeah. as the priestly, the prophet and the kingly. And like yeah. I said, this book is more talking about the royal aspect. Yeah. But another question, and this one is kind of similar in like that it kind of talks about different categories or whatnot, so we don't have to spend too, too much time on it. But my buddy Dale Gentry, who ha he has a small YouTube channel too, who I've had on this show, it's called uh, Disciple Science, which is pretty, pretty cool. He like really links a lot of like environmental issues and science issues to discipleship. But he asked, he said, ask him about Job. I've heard some people say that Job is messianic in that he was able to pray for his friends after he sort of like passed the test and like didn't lose faith. Job 42, 7 through 9. So I think that kind of like, like we mentioned, kind of talks about more of a prophetic aspect, which isn't necessarily what this book is talking about. But not to say that it's not messianic, but maybe you have a few other yeah, thoughts. Yeah, I'll... I'll chime in and Dale th thanks for uh, the, the question you know what, what's interesting to me is um, Job kind of fits into this category of wisdom literature right and um, you know you, you don't find a lot of discussions kind of about well what what might there be messianic to detect from this book or, or to listen to and to hear from it and receive from this book and I think there's, I mean, so much there, right? Um, where we don't see that the simple answer that why everyone's, what, why Job is suffering is because he's sin. There's a complexity to God that is just beyond. And when God just shows up and reveals himself to Job after all his friends have been <laughs> ridiculing him, um, I think is just a wonderful, um, I guess, invitation to kind of gaze upon the God we can trust, even when things aren't adding up. And, and if we want to move in this sort of direction that, that Ethan was wondering about in terms of messianically, I don't know necessarily when Job um, kind of intercedes for his friends and, and prays for them. Um, that it's automatically saying kind of being written to kind of give us hopes, at least in a first reading of a future king who's going to do a sort of thing like that. Uh, we might be able to get that from some other passages. Um, but it reminds me a bit of um, kind of what you see in Joseph at the end of his life, who, who his brothers were scared to death that he was going to kill, he was going to kill them after uh, their dad Jacob died because all the evil they'd done. And you see him responding with this kind of divine vantage point, this graciousness in the face of evil. And I think certainly like if, if in the Royal Messianic sense, I'm hesitant to point from the end of Job to Jesus in other ways, I'm very excited to see, like, wow, this dude for like 30 chapters has just been like beat up by his friends. <laughs> He's been accused of being a sinner. He's been accused of just, you know, being deceived and all this stuff. Job's been pleading his innocence. And instead of doing that kind of told you so dance at the end, <laughs> he intercedes for him. And I think what a wonderful picture as God was hardwiring, what should the ideal response to suffering be before God and also towards those who've maybe misunderstood your suffering? Like you can see that in Job. And I think God was hardwiring that sort of ideal picture of how one should live in God's world in a way that was preparing for how Jesus models that. Um, so I, again, if I could add just another category, mm -hmm. 
if Job's presenting us like with an ideal of like what like common in wisdom literature, it's more thinking, how do you live wisely in God's creation? How do you live wisely as a human being? We can see this pointing to Jesus as kind of the ultimate human being, the second Adam of sorts. So so if, if I could add, kind of move away from the messianic a little bit to more so this ideal Adam figure, or I, ideal human, um, you know, similar to like what we see in Psalm 8, um, you know, I, I think certainly I'm comfortable ha- let, seeing it bearing witness to, to Christ in that way. Yeah, something I'm really seeing, like kind of connecting as you're speaking on these different things and this is a little bit off topic but it's definitely like i don't know i always make like in different connections whenever i'm actually talking to people like you so yeah just, just run it by you but so i've been learning i've been talking to my buddy john who's got a channel apocalypse here in the chat we've talked a lot and we were just really like talking a while like what is the bible right like what there's it's not when i first became a christian you know you think it's so simple like the bible is the bible right like it's not that hard but like he was telling me about stanley Hauerwas, how he describes it as like the bible really gives us these like categories and like language to speak about things and i think like as you're talking like this book does a really good job of giving us the categories of like what a royal messiah is and like where do we find you know this is these type of things, but then as you're talking like a ty- a second, like a second Adam, you know, that's another category that's sort of like the Old Testament is like where we want to build off these categories to have like a solid foundation mm-hmm. in the Bible, right? And that's like yeah. what I'm hearing, kind of how you're putting these things together, kind of in a similar way, right? You're pulling yeah. these themes and using the language of the Old Testament to really understand Jesus. And I think that, I don't know, I just kind of made that connection. Yeah. I think you're along the yeah. same lines. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's great. Yeah. I, I, uh, I think it's, it's really helpful even see throughout the old Testament, these categories kind of developing and over time, um, you know, at least in my own teaching and writing, I found that having clarity in terms of categories can be helpful but what you can also get into is people who already have in mind what they think you should mean by the category Mm -hmm. (laughs) like messiah or something and you're it's not the way they view it and Mm -hmm. uh, they don't kind of take the time to try to hear you out so so i think certainly the categories i'm introducing are hopefully will be useful like discussion points for hopefully more and more clarity coming on what we're doing when we're thinking about especially um, expectations about Jesus, how the Old Testament relates to Christ um, Mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. For sure. So a question from Apocalypse here. He asked, uh, I don't know the exact word, but he wanted to know if you've had, what the reception of this book has been like among Jewish scholars, if you've had some Jewish scholars read the book and what they've thought about it. Yeah, yeah. Great question. I haven't heard from any uh, Jewish scholars who, who've read it. Um, you know, it's kind of funny how we're all in our own orbits, right? And so when you publish a book, like Baker Academic is known to be a Christian publishing house. Um, and, you know, it's primarily going to uh, find a, a Christian uh, audience. Um, and you know that that's just kind of the nature of things um so one of the things i'd hope that if uh, a jewish audience uh, were listening uh, or reading the book I, I think they'd appreciate the caution that we have the desire to listen well to to the text um and not kind of over i guess overplay things um, the most reaction I've had are to people who follow like uh, John Salheimer, who, who's like a, a evangelical Old Testament scholar who, who would do some of the most radical readings of scripture to kind of make it work, if you will, um, with um, what I kind of criticize in the book is a little bit of an overplaying of one's hand. Um, 
and the the feedback I've gotten isn't so much about the text or the Bible itself. It's more so, well, why don't you like Salheimer? I'm like, well, I've written about it in the book in light of scripture. So like, tell me if, well, tell me from scripture, like what you think Salheimer, <laughs> where I've, I've got mm-hmm. off as opposed to just them not liking that I'm part of his fan club. So, um, but yeah, in terms of Jewish scholars, um, haven't heard much from, but I've welcomed yeah. any any comments and interaction yeah for sure i think like what you said i think uh, i think they would appreciate like you said the caution i mean i don't think uh, it's clearly uh, you're clearly a christian and writing this book so it would be weird if you just like wrote about a royal messiah and never mentioned jesus or something right like it would it's not and that's fair and i think like you said you approach it with the caution where i don't think you're like going against what the text has to say in a you know i i think it does a really good job yeah. But, so what for those just a little okay. insight into how the book developed, you know, Greg and I weren't sure if we were going to have at, what we've added. I think we call them epilogues at the end of each chapter where we kind of move from trying to hear what, say, the book of Chronicles was saying in its post exilic context and its hope for um, uh, how messianic hope maybe fits in there. Um, and then we have an epilogue that reflects more canonically on how it bears witness to Jesus. So I, I think that was an attempt to, I think, whether it's just general Old Testament scholars, whether Christian or not, would appreciate the caution uh, that we're using and the desire to listen closely uh, to the text. But then also for my those like me and, and others who, who are Christians and want to say, well, how after a close reading that maybe produces a reading of a messianic hope, maybe that's slightly different than kind of a, oh, here's this individual prediction. And then we see it quoted in the Mm -hmm. news, like, how might we think about how this bears witness to Jesus? We try to tease that out a bit um, in more of a kind of epilogue addendum to each chapter. So Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's really, really good. So next question, Mine Onion asks, to what degree did the people who wrote the books of the New Testament apo- approach writing with the idea that they could expect to find details about Jesus' life in the Old Testament already in mind? So I think this is like a really big thing among like, you know, non-Christians where they think about, not to like say only there, but I think that's a big thing people think about, right? Like, did the gospel authors just write like, oh, here we see this, let's put this here, or did they, you know... How do, how do you kind of think about that? And that kind of gets into the New Testament, which you do write in the conclusion, kind of like how to think about the New yeah. Testament in light of all these things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. First of all, thank, thanks for the, the question. You know, it, it's a, a great question uh, about, okay, when these New Testament authors were writing, um, how were they engaging with the Old Testament in itself, right? What, what were they trying to find? in what New Testament scholars have have seen it is a, a couple threads that I guess inform what we could call an apostolic hermeneutic, how the, how the apostles read the Old Testament. And one of them is to recognize that they were employing interpretive methods that were just common practice among Jews, you know, who were non-Christians. And we see some really fascinating sort of eschatological readings in Qumran, uh, where, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And they were regularly, you know, drawing upon different passages in the Old Testament, reading them in more of a messianic way, um, and um, trying to detect, you know, details in the texts where the the, they have this teacher of righteousness who supposedly had this insight into the text who, who could really make these sorts of connections. So when you see the New Testament writers um, kind of connecting passages in the Old Testament that maybe at first reading, um, you're like, whoa, okay, I don't know that I would have known that was predicting the Messiah. Um, to Jesus, they're, they're interpreting it in a way that had currency of the time. And, and you wouldn't write a book like Matthew and use like 
these quotations if they weren't going to resonate with the Jewish audience at the time. So, so they're using those methods. But the, the question is, is where did they get this, th these connections from? And, and I think in part, it, it was from Jesus himself. Jesus spent time with them interpreting scriptures. And when he uh, was resurrected from the dead in Luke 24, you see him kind of explaining all things related to himself from the Old Testament to the disciples. They said their hearts were burning. Um, and you see some of, um, it, you recognize like, oh, wow, okay, we're at this kind of eschatological moment. We've seen God himself in the flesh, like, wow okay we have these new lenses now that we're putting on now let's see what we see because jesus has helped us see how to to read and find things so it, so um you know you mentioned paul earlier like how does he go from like being this pharisee who knows scripture so well and thinks that jesus certainly is not the messiah to then he devotes his whole life to it you know it came from this sort of conviction of God breaking in and showing this risen Lord Jesus and that obviously gave him a new lens for how to put pieces um, together um, so um, so I think it's a bit of you know when we think about this um, there's there's this sort of use of this Pesher exegesis of giving kind of insight into revelation that we find from the Old Testament. But then now they have the lens and they can just look back and say, wow, now we can see how these things were preparing for Christ. Yeah, I think it's like whenever I think about, you know, how they uh, like the New Testament authors interpreted the old, like I always we think like we need to be so careful and we do right to like try and understand these things. But then like you'll read Paul where he's just like, Oh yeah, Jesus is the rock in Exodus. Right. And you're like, yeah. you know what? It's like, I never yeah. would have, you don't read Exodus and just like, Oh yeah, obviously <laughs> Jesus is this rock that water comes out of. Right. You know, that's yeah. just not the way it works. So it's like in light of Christ, we, it, I think that's really where that really like, sets at home where we see like in light of christ we could see these things that we just yeah. couldn't you couldn't have seen before yeah but that doesn't mean they weren't there right so it's yeah. just a yeah yeah and i think one, one way to look at it is like i i love the the larger idea of like looking for theological patterning they could look at the old testament and say whoa look at how god worked this way back then all right, if the kind of, if history is all heading in this one direction, wow, we can really now see how that theological pattern reveals something about God that then is kind of shown in a greater light when Jesus, the full revelation of God comes. So, um, so I think they're drawing a lot of these sort of connections because they're seeing, hey, this is the same God. This is a story about the same God. Mm -hmm. that was preparing for this moment and they're seeing kind of history wired in a way that was preparing for for this so it, yeah. yeah and i found what i was i was looking for as you were speaking out just like whenever i get a scripture in my mind i'm like always oh, like ah, i gotta find it so yeah, yeah. first corinthians 10 4, 10 4 and it says that and they all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was christ like Paul just flat out says, like the rock was Christ, right? And this is like, yeah, it's just really interesting the way we would. That's what when I like for was in like a a Bible study with my pastor, and they were, were like, how do we, you know, you don't want to like I say you don't want to twist everything to point to Jesus, but then again, mm -hmm. you see something like this, and it's like it's okay to make connections, right? In light of yeah. like being led by the Spirit when you read and stuff, these things are. It's a, it's just, it's interesting. I, it, yeah, I don't know exactly what I'm trying to get at, but yeah, yeah there's some really. Well, I would, I would say too, you know, for any listeners out there who are um, Christians and have Jewish friends, or those who who are Jewish out there, I, I think one thing that's important to say it, to see is that sort of reading of well, the rock is Christ. Like, it doesn't necessarily cancel out what the first reading was revealing mm -hmm. in the first sense like like 
there is so much that's being revealed about God just simply through seeing how God was providing water through this rock in the, the wilderness, through how that's fitting in what's being communicated there. And so we could just maybe look at, okay, without canceling out that first reading, then maybe you add another layer of reading to say, well, maybe, okay, God's shown himself to be with his people constantly, to be constantly nourishing them. Okay, this is a type for, for Christ to who is the same with his uh, church today. So, uh, so I think we, we don't have to cancel out that more historical, literal sort of reading in the, in the process. We can kind of benefit from both. Yeah, I think that's really important. You're right. We really need to, like I said, it doesn't cancel out. I think that's yeah. a really, really important thing to hammer home. Like you yeah. can see something as a prophecy or as speaking of Christ, but it still does have another meaning. And that's what, I've like told people, right? Like if you speak to your a Jewish friend or something, it's not like, and we didn't even talk about uh, like Isaiah 53 or anything, yeah. but like, that's one of the most common ones. And it's not like a Jewish person, like, Ooh, Isaiah 53, let me just skip over to like Isaiah 55 or, you know, I don't read that yeah. part. You know, it's not, that's not the way it works at all. Like there is a way of reading this, you know, uh, you can read it in different ways. And like, so I think it's important to, to hammer home that, you know, one reading yeah. doesn't there is a meaning to the text it's not ambiguous you can't make it say whatever you want but yeah like yeah it's yeah so it's pretty complicated and, and i would and i would just say too i so my next book i don't necessarily wasn't planning to plug this but but my next book that's coming out this summer is called discovering isaiah and that's with erdman's and the idea is to integrate like backgrounds literary study but also reception history of isaiah into sort of an introduction. And one of the things that really struck me was how regularly the, like say Isaiah 7, 14, you know, this pr prophecy about Emmanuel or Isaiah 53, you know, the Christian interpreters were regularly aware of what Jews were saying in response to the readings. And I think it actually promoted better readings, richer readings of the scriptures from that layer of accountability. And, um, it, it, and so I would just say that, that these instincts of wanting to read with in mind that, okay, well, let's not just overlay everything Christian wise, you know, that that might override a more natural reading of the text, which still is a very Christian reading, right? It, it doesn't mean it's an unchristian reading, I, I should say. Um, so I, I would just say that those are just instincts that have proven, I think, to be really beneficial for the church to really be hearing what, what God's saying through his word. Yeah, yeah, yeah I really appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. So I think that we'll hit this one last question and Apocalypse here says, could Dr. Abernathy give some more specific advice for engaging with Jewish interpreters of the text? Of course, we'll disagree on many things, but what sort of posture do we need to take? And I think that I could, if I could expand on that a little bit, that kind of plays into a question I wanted to ask too, as we kind of close up and just like, as we're engaging with like your book or, um, Oh wait, whatever. Eddie, some other book. I'm, ADD is bad. I saw it like, <laughs> did you see mine in the chat? So I just like lost my train of thought. But there might be one more quick one after this. We'll see. But we, we're planning to go about an hour. But with his question, kind of like, how do we advice for engaging with Jewish interpreters? And just if you could maybe touch on a little bit of like broad advice for people like myself who don't have like formal education, you know, like. I know obviously like your book here is a great resource, but like even you writing this book, you wouldn't like suggest I just every word in the book, I just say like, now I can go argue with somebody, right? Like it no. says right here, right? This is like just a fact, you know, that's just not the way it works. So what kind of advice do you have for, like I said, engaging with Jewish interpreters and then just like advice for people like myself, just how to, for thinking about these topics, you know, critically engaging when maybe I don't have as much background knowledge as someone with a formal education or whatnot, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. If that makes sense, if I wasn't rambling yeah, a little though, too much. 
No, th those are great questions. And I'm happy to engage with whatever you're the guy in the uh, yeah. <laughs> chat was saying, if you, if you get his question. Um, you know, the, the biggest thing with, with Jewish interpretation is there are a whole bunch of varieties, um, just like there are a whole bunch of varieties of Christian interpretation. Um, and to just be willing to begin by listening, um, begin to listen to, to what is actually being said and, and to have that open posture of like you would with, with anybody you're reading with of, okay, are there things I'm missing in the text here? Because we don't need to be afraid of what's actually in the scriptures. Like, and if a reading with a, a, a Jew who, who's probably seen things that, that might be being overlooked or neglected, um, you need to benefit from that. And just having a posture of learning, I, I think is just huge. Um, and, you know, like it, the, there's, um, you know, I, the relationship between Jews and Christians has been uh, just so fraught. I mean, you think of how Christianity has played a role in um, oppressing Jews, not, not just with the Shoah, but also with, um, you know, a lot of European persecution of Jews throughout the Middle Ages. Um, you know, I, I think there are, are just needs to be trust and, and needs to be relationships built. And, um, you know, and hopefully there's an invitation for them to reciprocate a willingness to listen and hear what you have to say. Um, and my, um, so that that's really my biggest advice is not to assume every Jew you meet has a really strong position and has thought through Isaiah 53, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, or not to assume everybody has the same interpretation. You know, Eben Ezra, it's so funny in his commentary. Eben Ezra is a medieval commentator. Um, on Isaiah 53, he gives a whole interpretation of Isaiah 53 as if it was corporate Israel, suffering and so forth. But then at the end, he sneaks in a little comment. He says, but I actually think this was a suffering prophet, <laughs> you know, but like he just kind of kept with like the main reading and the, you know, these are debated questions as well among Jews. And, and I think that uh, that posture is important for, for the general. Yeah. If I could actually, I'll sneak in Eddie's question and then we'll kind of yeah. end on my more general yeah. question, I think would be a really yeah. good way to end. But he yeah. asks, uh, what do you think about typ typological prophecies and parallels in the old testament is that what he was addressing with the book okay yeah so just kind of like typological prophecies kind of how like yeah. adam is a type of christ and so that, which we did touch yeah. on a little bit but yeah yeah great great question um you know in our book we don't do as much with typology um aside from i i suppose you you could call it typology when you see sort of an, a portrait of, of an ideal king emerging. So for instance, like when you look at how the story of David is written, like the first, you know, block of his sort of the narrative about him and his reign all the way up to second Samuel 10 is just glorious. It's like, wow, there's rest from enemies all around. There's the ark, everyone's worshiping the Lord around the ark. And then he sins with Bathsheba, okay? And things begin to unravel. Okay, Solomon, similar. You get this ideal portrait. Wow, you know, they're eating under their vines and fig trees. and um, But then you see things unravel as well. And so you, you get this sort of types emerging, I guess, in terms of ideal expectations of what a good king is like, what um, one would hope for and expect in a king and so forth. So, so to that extent, yeah, we, we deal with that in the book. Um, but I think my guess is that what's in mind is, is more of a larger question around what we would call figural interpretation, which would include typology, which would say, okay, do we see any persons, events, or institutions in the Old Testament 
that are kind of written into Israel's script and history that are kind of types for a greater fulfillment that's going to be find, found in Jesus. And, and we don't kind of get into that too much. I'm not necessarily opposed to that. Um, but, you, you know, if people want to read more about that, some people love, I, I had my students read Edmund Clowney's book, um, Unfolding the Mystery. Uh, he's very typological. Um, um, there, there's a, a, a great guy named, I think it's David ba Baker, um, One Bible, Two Testaments, who talks a bit about typology. And really, if I could just give a little backdrop, mm -hmm. When I was first studying to read the Old Testament, man, it's like I had been trained, don't connect the old to Jesus. Like, just read the passage, read what it's saying. Don't like impose Jesus into it. So like I was like kind of raised in that like, or not raised, I was trained in that kind of grammatical historical focus on just getting that original meaning. Um, but re really opened me up to actually more typological readings was reading a Jewish scholar. Uh, Michael Fishbane has this great book called um, Biblical Interpretation in Ancient Israel. And he looks at the different ways the biblical authors were actually interpreting and you see them draw on different types like the Exodus. He's, and it's all grounded in this conviction of the same God acting in kind of patterned ways. And, and then I read Gerhard von Rod, who, who's a Christian Old Testament theologian, talking about typology within the Old Testament itself. And, and that's what I think helped free up, free up my conscience to kind of move in a typological way. So I hope that gives something for, uh, for your, uh, for our, yeah, the guy, definitely. the person who asked yeah. that question to you on. Yeah, it definitely does. I think, at least I think so. Yeah. I know he's been, uh, he told me about a book he's been reading called uh, Sitting at the Feet of Rabbi Jesus, I think is what the book's called. I'm not okay. sure if you're familiar, yeah. but yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, but I think that's really good. And so if we kind of close up, like what I want to start asking a lot of my guests, especially when I have, you know, people like yourself who are professionally trained, it's just like, what advice do you have for people like myself who, aren't, who don't have the formal education to kind of think, to think critically about these topics, not only to just like absorb the information. I think sometimes like I try to ask this, it comes across like, what's a good way to absorb the information, you know, like take notes or, you know, that's not necessarily what I'm getting at. It's just like, how do you think critically about this and not, not just take everything for granted that it's like death, you know, like, cause there's a lot of different views on a lot of these topics. So, you know, how do yeah. we, how do we think about yeah. it? Absolutely. I, I think you're spot on, Ethan. You know, sometimes we're like, oh, whatever we read or even sounds good. Like I, I do the one one class a semester, at least in my OT lit class, I'll come in and I'll just teach like on Joseph in a way that kind of preaches. It's like if God gives you dreams, mm -hmm. he's going to fulfill them. Look at how the mm -hmm. you know, and and like, yeah, yeah, you know, you can kind of like feel like they're saying things you like to hear. It sounds like you, it's preaching, you know, like, so I think you're right to kind of say, okay, um, uh, if one approaches scripture is inspired, okay, that's the only book in the world that's inspired. So I think scholars are writing it, you know, or, or um, to be dialogue partners for you. And, and I think that my biggest encouragement would be give yourself to the study of scripture. Um, give yourself, uh, say in this case, um, what are some of the key passages you see um, Greg and I talking about in the book um, and go to the scriptures, see what you think. Um, begin, um, well, I'll kind of open before the Lord, all right, help me see here, help me grow here. And to really um, go back to the scriptures. And, and I would say this as well, Ethan, like <clears throat> you, and I mentioned this in my Ford podcast, like, <clears throat> I think we get obsessed with like reading scripture to try to understand things, how the puzzle fits together. But like scripture is there for God to reveal himself to us. So like <clears throat> realize that like, a lot of the scholarly discussions that you step into are really just a part of what reading the Bible should be all about. And like, even if you don't have everything figured out and scholars certainly don't, 
and you may end up having more questions after reading a book than you started with. Like there is still the same God who has met with you before and spoken through scriptures, who's revealed himself to you, who's encouraged you through his word, that you need to keep coming to that well. Keep coming, keep coming, and then see how what you're reading really helps you maybe better see and hear from God through the scriptures, but but not to divorce this sort of wanting to understand the more critical discussions from how this is feeding into personal uh, relationship with God. Awesome. Yes, I think that's really, really well said and some great advice. So, yeah. perfect. We're right at about an hour little over and i think that's the perfect place to end it so yeah i really appreciate you coming on everyone should definitely check out the book god's messiah in the old testament uh, i have a link to the book on amazon in the description of this video and like dr i said he's been on a number of other podcasts so maybe they hit on something i didn't hit on but i think we hit on some really good topics that question i think it was really good to hit on questions people actually had you know we yeah. so I appreciate everybody for watching. I really appreciate Dr. Abernathy for giving his time and coming on. This was huge. I couldn't do my channel without scholars like himself coming on and doing these interviews. And I've just been learning so much. It's really like great for myself because it like gives me a little bit of like homework to do. Right, I gotta like start reading and getting ready, and I end up learning a lot by doing these. And then when we have these conversations, it's really I, I feel like I make a lot of connections that maybe I didn't make before. So I really, really appreciate you coming on. Hope you enjoyed yourself. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, with that, I guess we'll yeah, end it right there. Great. Unless yeah, it was great anything. being on with you, Ethan. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks everybody for watching. Thank mm -hmm. you.